Hello, and welcome to World Unity Week, which is launching the 99 Days of Peace Through Unity, an initiative that started on June 21st, summer solstice. The 99 day event and broadcast culminates in the United Nations sponsored International Day of Peace on September 21st. Thousands of people worldwide are participating. Hundreds of peace organizations are launching wonderful events. Each group is different. Each organization is worthy. My name is Jay Frederick Arment. I'm chair of the board of the nonprofit organization, Cities of Peace. I'm also the founder of the member association of international cities of peace, which has grown to include over 70 countries around the world. I'm here to tell you about an amazing global phenomenon, a peace movement as ancient as civilization. Yet international cities of peace becomes new each week as more communities self-establish as peace cities. These communities are dedicated to localizing a culture of peace. They develop practical action plans to increase their safety, prosperity, and quality of life for everyone in their community. Nearly 14 years ago, the Association of International Cities of Peace was founded on several important principles, which I'll be telling you about today. In my particular city, Dayton, Ohio, in the United States, our community felt a strong responsibility to honor a legacy of peace that occurred in our city. In 1995, the Bosnian War in Europe had killed over 100,000 women and children, men forced to take up arms, civilians, those caught in the streets of Sarajevo, much like the horrible circumstances in Ukraine today. When all else failed, the three presidents of the warring parties were brought to Dayton, Ohio, to see if there could be an end to the madness. In November 1995, thank goodness, a peace treaty was, rec was recognized and, and negotiated and signed. After 100,000 died, on the day the treaty was signed, the gun stopped, the war ended. This was a fragile peace, yet it has been nearly 30 years, and time will tell if the peace between the diverse populations in that part of the world will finally hold. The people of Dayton took their role seriously. Daytonians lined the streets when the presidents arrived. We treated the leaders with respect. We took the leaders to a symphony to the mall, to where regular people gather. Daytonians sent their good thoughts and their prayers. After the war was stopped, the people of Dayton felt a responsibility to tell their children, to tell the world what happened in our city. It was a legacy of peacemaking that is uncommon in the world, yet Dayton is not alone in this responsibility. Every community on earth has a peace legacy that must be told to children. Maybe there was a great teacher an important innovation, a mediated dispute. All communities constantly work for peace. Every community has a peace legacy about efforts to increase safety, prosperity, and quality of life for its citizens. In effect, each community works to establish a culture of peace. And that's where International Cities of Peace helps. Hundreds of cities have found International Cities of Peace a brilliant and workable way to make a community better, a better region, a better world. And there's more good news to tell, more questions to ask. Why is peace so elusive? How can unity bring the peace for which we all yearn? First things first. First things first, what is unity? It's World Unity Week, but what does unity mean? I think a lot of us have an idea. We know the definition. It means oneness the state of being one. It means wholeness, combining all the parts into one. It means integrity, strength through diversity as one, and harmony, concord, and agreement. So International Cities of Peace was created to incorporate all the definitions of unity into a practical way to bring peace to the world. Going back to our question, why is peace so elusive? And why is unity so important? So if we look at the four definitions of unity that we just went over, the, you know, number one, the state of being one. Uh, there are seven, over seven billion people in the world, and that's a huge community. And what we have 
is in order to be one, we have to develop community. We can't develop divisions. Number two, combining the parts into the whole. We have to have understand the diversity and create a global network. And that's what <clears throat> International Cities of Peace is doing. Building a community, understanding diversity. Number three, being of uniform character. What are the consensus values that we all can agree on? The consensus values of peace, which we defined uh, and when we first started in 2009, safety for our families, prosperity so that we can feed our children, and quality of life so we can achieve our purpose. And there hasn't been any pushback for that. There's consensus on those. And number four, harmony, concord, agreement. Um, it's an association, not a top-down NGO. We've sort of turned the idea of an NGO on its head. We have a small central organization. All of the energy goes out to the cities of peace themselves. So we've built a community, a diverse network, We've achieved consensus values around the world, and we've created an association rather than something that tells people what to do. ICP was founded on the human right to respect. Everyone has respect, has a right to respect, and we respect that right, and that's why we create peace teams and, and, and leaders to develop um, each city of peace. As I've said, we're currently approaching 400 cities of peace. That's in over 70 countries, all six continents. So we have grown organically over the years. We haven't done any advertising. What we've done is create uh, a platform that cities of peace around the world can use to develop their own peacemaking within their own community. And that has resonated with people. The ideal of a city of peace is why we have grown. So our goal is to grow to 1,000 cities of peace by year 2025. And we're on track for that. We're going to be able to do that. We have to upgrade some of our technology, which is uh, going to occur this year. But at a certain point, uh, people will be able to come and they'll be able to establish their, their goals and objectives and create a web page within International Cities of Peace. It's all free. And um, they'll be able to uh, begin working in their community. So why become a city of peace? We have a vision, mission, and goal. First of all, uh, our vision is to ensure everyone's right to the consensus values of global peace, safety, prosperity, and quality of life. We haven't had any pushback for this definition uh, over the years because everyone wants to be safe. Everyone wants to be able to feed their family. And everyone wants to have a certain level of quality of life, for instance, uh, uh, clean water and housing uh, in order to achieve their purpose. So everyone to achieve their purpose. And if we had just simple safety, prosperity, and quality of life around the world, there would be global peace. Our mission is to build this scalable network of on-the-ground teams committed to peace building in cities of peace around the world. And that's what's happening. There are city of peace teams developing strategies and implementing strategies and measuring that strategy, modifying it so that it's more efficient. Our goal is to certify and recommend that these thousands of self-organized, and that's a really important word, self-organized municipalities as cities of peace in order to put in motion a tipping force for global peace. And I think that's when it will come. When the communities engage with each other and create peace within the community, then that is the, the makings of global peace. That is the oneness, the integrity, the strength. So cities of peace, the reason we chose cities is because it's the closest municipal unit to the family and the individual. It's the core of a culture of peace. And Lao Tzu uh, from the Tao Te Ching um, defined it, if there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. And if there is to be peace in the cities, there needs to be peace in the neighbor, between neighbors. And if there is peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. And if there is peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. And those are profound words. Many of you have heard it before, but it's very cogent to the idea of international cities of peace. The first city of peace I'd like to highlight is Zihuatanejo, Mexico. 
and that is in the Guerrero Strait. And uh, the leader, Wendy Carbajal, um, has just announced a new peace education package for uh, cities throughout um, uh, Mexico and Central America, Spanish-speaking peace education. And I didn't know about this until it was posted on our Facebook site. Um, and it's just one of the things that come in each week, 50 or more um, emails with new initiatives and new situations that need to be uh, clarified. So we'd like to honor Wendy today. Um, the next one is uh, Franklin Township in the USA, City of Peace. Tulsi Maharan um, is organizing Peace Day events for many, many years. Um, but Peace Day is very important to all cities of peace. Uh, at the end of uh, September, um, we compile a bunch of, um, of of photos and videos and create an amazing panel play of, of uh, wonderful events uh, that teach peace, that celebrate peace, and that provide um, the next year of initiatives um, through the City of Peace Network. So what is a culture of peace that um, is so relevant to International Day of Peace in September? Uh, we call it Peace Day, Peace Week, Peace Month, uh, during the time of September. But there are eight specific tenets of a culture of peace laid out by UNESCO at the United Nations. Education, sustainable economic and social development, human rights, equality between men and women, democratic participation, understanding with tolerance and solidarity, participatory communication, free flow of information, and peace and security. These are the tenets of a culture of peace. If we had them, uh, we'd be much closer to uh, a more peaceful world. The one thing they did not uh, address directly was um, spirituality and the different religions. And that's a very difficult uh, situation around the world. Uh, it uh, has become very divisive. And so we have instituted the golden rule, which is do for others as you would have them do for you in many other ways to say that. But it's been embraced by all uh, spiritual traditions. And when they, people sign a um, letter of intent, um, the golden rule is a part of that. The next um, city of peace I'd like to, to highlight is um, Paul Bosola in uh, Kawimpe, Uganda, that created a city of peace uh, not long ago, but they're planting trees, they're teaching um, education on sustainable gardens, sustainable agriculture, and so they're focusing on climate. That's just one of the different ways people are uh, creating a city of peace uh, initiative. And as we said, we never tell people what to do, but they know what's needed in a community. It has to do with respect. So the next one uh, is very close to my heart because um, we received in 2018 a call from, um, from uh, China and in Nanjing, which is uh, one of the four uh, traditional capitals of, of China near Shanghai. And um, they had a traumatic experience in 1938. Um, they had an invasion and 300,000 people were massacred. So they have a, an institution, a memorial hall. And Professor Lu Chong is um, a professor at uh, Nanjing University, and he contacted us, and I worked with him, and we've become great friends. I've been to China uh, three times, and they've given me um, a warm welcome. And now they have three cities of peace in China. And Professor, professor Lu Chong has uh, initiated the first Journal of Peace Studies in China, and I'll be part of that. Um, and uh, it's just a wonderful uh, relationship that we've been able to build with people in China, peacemakers in China. It's very important to our future that uh, China embraces the idea of a city of peace. So I'd like to um, uh, give honor to the professor. Um, the, next, um, the next thing we'd like to talk about are what are the benefits that people get when they uh, initiate, establish their community as a city of peace. There are substantial benefits um, for the people around the world, uh, for the leaders and for the peace teams themselves. We, they get uh, a supply of information about peace activities around the world. They get affirmation 
In other words, there's a lot of peace uh, people who are um, not as overt in their public display. So we are able to affirm people's peacemaking and they achieve uh, a level of connection that they're not able to do without this kind of network. And they achieve legitimacy and authority within their community. And they get asked by the newspapers to do um, um, editorials and they uh, get the phone calls when there's something that happens. So the peacemakers gain voice. And they have, we have uh, an education called the Skills Development Program with um, things such as Mastering the Golden Rule and the Sustainable Development Goals. We also have funding options. We write letters of recommendation uh, after one year uh, where we're sure that people are actually working for peace. And funders really appreciate the fact that we vet um, the people that we give recommendations for. There's a whole online learning uh, aspect. There's there's this global presence we have, and there's a public relations um, uh, benefit to becoming a member of International Cities of Peace. And there's a huge peace community uh, that people talk to one another. There's city to city, um, just like the Sister Cities program, city to city, uh, two-way communication and support. In addition, there's UN representation. We are in special consultative status with uh, ECOSOC, the um, United Nations body for NGOs. So that gives us a lot of opportunity with the New York headquarters and around the world, especially UNESCO. So that's another benefit. And what we want to emphasize is this is totally free. We are not here to make money off of uh, international cities of peace around the world. We are here to provide services, to provide tools and resources uh, for those who decide to work for peace in their community. The next community I'd like to uh, emphasize is uh, Kajika in the Amazonas uh, of Colombia, City of Peace. Piedad Guzman uh, is a strong protector of human rights in that area. There's uh, over 100,000 people who have disappeared during the, um, the wars in Colombia. And Piedad uh, has been a, a consistent and strong voice uh, for those people who have disappeared and for human rights for children and human rights for uh, women. Uh, the next is uh, Sedona, Arizona, City of Peace. Margaret Joy Weaver and uh, three of her uh, colleagues uh, started it uh, back in 2012 and they have developed so many different um, platforms uh, for peacemaking in the world. They created a, a magazine called Imagine which is uh, based in peace building. Uh, uh, they have a meditation um, um, day and morning where uh, people can come from around Sedona and be a part of that. And there's many, many other initiatives uh, that they do in Sedona. The next one is really special, Dandora, which is um, the largest toxic dump in uh, Kenya. And these are kids who live in that dump. And there are fa five phases. Um, it's so large that there are five different communities and each of those communities have become city of peace in order to work within their uh, area which is called a phase. So I suggested that maybe if they got together and unified and worked for peace as a unit that they might be able to get more funding and things like that and they have uh, created a tremendous organization, a unity organization. Uh, these are the five leaders and those are just some of the kids who live in that community. There are thousands and uh, so I just uh, want to say that, you know, the city to city ideal uh, where cities work together is a big part of international cities of peace. And it um, enables people uh, from Europe to work with Africa, for Africa to work with the United States. A lot of different uh, uh, things are going on with that. Now, the next thing, you know, that's what we came here to hear, how to establish a city of peace. What is the process? And the process is very straightforward. It's intended to be very simple, five steps, but it's very profound. The people who, who, who go through this process have always said that this has created a new life, a new structure for how they live and how they work in their community. The first is you get uh, signatures on a letter of intent. In other words, you create a peace team. Then you write a vision, mission, and goals statement for the city. And this is where uh, people have to really think about how they work for peace and community. And this is what separates all the cities of peace, their vision, their mission and goals. It's all unique. Every single one of them is different. So they send photos and captions of local events. 
and they submit a photo of the leader so that we know more about them and they write a peace legacy for their community. What are the challenges? What are their solutions? And uh, we're going to be able to put this online so that people can use International Cities of Peace website, internationalcitiesofpeace.org, as the way to communicate, not only to people outside, but uh, people within. And so we're working on that right now. Uh, this is the letter of intent, which is um, a document that focuses on the UNESCO uh, tenants of a culture of peace and people fill in their municipality and they get signatures. There's a couple of signature pages attached to it. Um, and we have um, the option of having a peace proclamation by um, the city mayor, the city commission, uh, the chief of the village. Um, they can proclaim an international city of peace. It's not required. Some places it's difficult to get the government and the grassroots organizations to work together. So this is something that can be an objective or it can be accomplished immediately. So the next um, uh, uh, city of peace I'd like to uh, 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 honor is um, Westerly Pocatuck in the United States city of peace. Frank Thacker, um, he is a very humble man. I've become friends with him, um, but he put together a nonviolence podcast, a blog, um, the Daily Peacemaker, and he's co created episode uh, 18, uh, and he hopes to create a classroom where he can um, talk about King and Gandhi and people like that. But that's how unique each of those cities is. Each city has an amazing idea, and they follow through, and um, it, it changes them, and it changes the world. So the next one is close to my heart, uh, Kanani, Uganda. Um, Ronald Kayimba is a, is a very dynamic individual. Um, he took the Golden Rule course that's, that's on our um, uh, website, and he really took to the idea of the Golden Rule as a healing and curative um, uh, instrument that's ancient and it's also modern. So he's created Golden Rule Education. Uh, and it increases com empathy and compassion and, and the engagement that we need in order to find unity uh, in our cities and in our world. So uh, the last one, uh, McCurdy, Nigeria, Dorothy Akinde. Um, she just received funding based on a recommendation from International Cities of Peace to a grantor uh, for a human trafficking um, safe place. So we're very pleased with that. A lot of the Cities of Peace uh, get funding based on our recommendation. Uh, we do not, um, uh, we are not a grantor, but um, we help uh, people find um, grantors and make recommendations. And hopefully um, most of their activities are volunteer, but sometimes you need a little funding. Thank you for listening. I know that was a lot to take in, but um... Uh, there are many other cities of peace. Those are just ones that um, came in over the last couple of weeks with just an update. But, you know, 360 cities of peace, um, all of them working in different ways. Uh, that's a lot of material for case studies and a lot of material to prove that International Cities of Peace is a viable and productive peacemaking organization. Um, the Cities of Peace uh, uh, case studies, are all over the world, 70 countries on all, all six uh, continents, uh, South Korea, Somalia, Brazil, New Zealand, Indonesia, and more. And we have several dreams. The first, to have safety, prosperity, and quality of life, the consensus values of peace, become the goal of humanity. Number two, Stop regional conflicts at the local level before they monasticize uh, into the region, into the world. And number three, building the infrastructure of peace, the roads and bridges through which peace may travel. In order to get to 1,000 cities of peace and beyond, we need additional technology. We need to upgrade our website. We need to automate some of the processes right now that are very manual in nature. So. Uh, there's two ways to really help. One, establish your city as a city of peace, which is a very profound uh, opportunity. And number two, if you can donate, please do, because 
this year in particular, um, we need extra funds in order to upgrade uh, our technology in order to achieve our goal of 1,000 cities of peace by year 2025. We can do that. We're on our way. So peace is possible, one community at a time. I thank you for listening, and uh, peace to you and yours. www.internationalcitiesofpeace.org. Thank you.